Hello, I don't know if it's your first time here on the channel or if you already watched my Spirited Away review, it's away, welcome. Here we are today for the first Japanese lesson, which will be about the writing systems, hiragana and katakana. I don't think you have seen my cat yet, so here it is. Well, he's, uh, he's sleeping, he doesn't want to wake up. Let's not bother him. You are here for the Japanese lessons, not for the cat. So one year ago, I found myself asking the question, where do I even begin with the Japanese? And I reached the conclusion that I should start out by learning about the writing system. Fast forward to today, I believe I made the right decision for reasons I will explain later. Modern Japanese is written in a mixture of three basic scripts which is hiragana, katakana and kanji. Hiragana and katakana, when they are together, are called kana and they are syllabic, which means that each character translates into a specific sound. Notice that these are not alphabets because they do not represent individual letters. On the other hand, kanji is logographic, which means that each character translates into a word or concept. This last statement is actually an oversimplification of reality, but we aren't going to talk about kanji today. We will only be talking about hiragana and katakana. We will save the kanji for later. Hiragana and katakana are two different ways to write the same set of 46 sounds. In other words, a specific sound can be written in hiragana or katakana, which probably makes you wonder why these two systems even exist at the same time? The choice between using hiragana and katakana comes down to the context. While hiragana is mainly used for the grammatical elements of sentences, katakana is most often used for foreign words, loanwords, onomatopoeia, scientific names and sometimes for emphasis, which leaves the kanji as a primary choice for the lexical elements, such as nouns, adjectives, and so forth. If this sounds confusing, do not worry because I will bring an example to clear things out, which you probably can see on screen right now. On this sentence, the katakana elements are represented in blue, tiragana ones in green, and kanji in red. Foku and teburu are respectively fork and table. O is the radical of the verb fall, while shita is responsible for its conjugation to the past tense fell. Wa is a particle, and kara, in this case, means from. The fork fell from the table. As you can see, the loan words fork and table are written in katakana, the radical of the verb is written in kanji, and the grammatical parts of the sentence are written in hiragana. There is no escaping it. You need to learn the three writing systems in order to be able to read even the most basic sentences in Japanese. Even if you find your current self raising an eyebrow at one of these systems. We're probably thinking, wouldn't it be much easier if it was all written in hiragana? And I thought the same thing at first, but if you read a, te a text written entirely in hiragana, you will understand why the three systems are used. Because it is so bad, it burns the eyes. I don't know if you have realized, but there are no spaces in the Japanese sentence I used as an example. This was not an accident. They truly do not have spaces in their sentences. And therefore, the use of the three writing systems steps in to help make the reading process clearer and less of an eyesore. Here, let me show you what a text written entirely in hiragana would look like. If you happen to dislike one of the systems, at least now you know that your perspective might change later on. But if you already have some experience in Japanese, tell me in the comments below if you were a kanji hater or a katakana hater, because I think all Japanese learners can be divided into these two groups. Everyone loves hiragana, no one hates hiragana. But back to the topic at hand. For I have talked plenty about the three writing systems, but didn't actually show them to you yet. Let's start with hiragana, which is easily recognizable for its characters with rounded and soft shapes. As established earlier, hiragana is used mainly for grammatical purposes, but that's not everything. There are a lot of kanji that are extremely complex and rare, 
to the point even Japanese people would have trouble recognizing them, in which case they can be replaced by hiragana, or at the very least they can be accompanied by it. We'll talk more about it on another occasion. It is also common back practice for children and people who are still learning Japanese to use hiragana in place of kanji they don't know. As a title of curiosity, I will also tell you a bit about how hiragana came to be. Ancient Japan didn't have a writing system of its own. However, many aristocrats and intellectuals had learned Chinese, which was introduced in Japan by Korean Buddhist missionaries sometime between the 4th and 5th century. As a result, Chinese was the language used to write official documents and Buddhist scriptures back in the day. Over time, Japanese aristocrats started writing Japanese using Chinese characters. This development gave rise to the first kana writing system, known as the Ma Nyo Gana, a system in which Chinese characters were used to represent phonetic sounds rather than their original meanings. And being as complex as it was, it was only available to a very small scholarly class. Then, in the 9th century, during the Ayan period, women of the imperial court began modifying the Ma Nyo Gana characters creating a writing system that was easier to use and more accessible. This system was the Honeid. The Honeid incorporated elements of a style of Chinese calligraphy called Shosho, grass script, into their characters. For a long time, Hiragana was considered by nobles and intellectuals as inferior, since it had been created by women and was mostly used by them, but it quickly spread through the general population. Hiragana initially consisted of about 90 different characters, but this number was reduced to just 46 during the 10th century. The set of 46 characters persists today and it's called Gojuon. The Gojuon system organizes characters according to their syllabic sounds, starting with the five vowel and combining them with consonant sounds. Hence, you are finally ready for your first lesson, which is to get familiar with these characters. Here is a table to help you out, but I strongly advise you to search for other tables, so you can find the one that suits you the best. If you find the characters for we and we on some of the tables, know that these are obsolete hiragana, they aren't used anymore. You might have noticed that there are some sounds missing on the table. The L sound, you ask? No, that one truly doesn't exist in the Japanese language. I'm talking about the G sound, the D sound, the P sound. How do we arrive to these? The answer lies in two concepts, which are called Dakuten and Andakuten. The Dakuten and Andakuten are simply put accents or diacritics, if you want to be pedantic, that change how a character sounds when added to it. Colloquially, Japanese people can also refer to them as Tenten and Maru, respectively. While Dakuten was used sporadically since the start of written Japanese, the Andakuten was introduced due to Portuguese Jesuits, which means that it was my people who created the Andakuten. You're welcome for having to learn one more thing. The Dakuten consists on two little traces that when added to a syllable indicate that its consonant shall be classified as voiced or madi. The term madi stems from Chinese phonology, where consonants were traditionally classified as clear, voiceless, lesser clear, aspirated and madi, voiced. The Andakuten, on the other hand, consists on a little dot that is used on syllables starting with H to indicate that they should instead be pronounced with P. In practice, you don't have to know all that. All that you need to know is represented on this table. Now let's talk about katakana. Given the association of katakana with foreign words, you might be led to believe that its introduction on the Japanese writing system occurred on a much later date as opposed to hiragana. Or at least, that was what I assumed. In actuality, katakana also derived, derives from Chinese characters, and it was created by Buddhist monks around the 8th or 9th century. It was first devised as a notation system to render Chinese texts into a form of Japanese, which means there are a lot less texts written in katakana in comparison to hiragana. This way of annotating 
Chinese texts so that the Japanese could read them was called Kanten. The earlier examples of Kanten date from the end of the 8th century. Initially, the katakana were used only by men, so unlike hiragana, katakana also saw use in official documents. Compared with the curved hiragana, katakana strokes are sharp and angular. You can learn the katakana on the following table that you are seeing on screen right now. Remember, the characters code for the exact same sounds as the ones you learned before. The 46th character that I omitted from the table is O or Wo. I chose not to put it on the table because it takes extremely rare. So, good news, you actually only need to learn 45 katakana instead of 46. And on some tables you might also find the characters we and we, just as in hiragana, but these are also too rare to include. And just like the hiragana, the katakana can too be modified by the dakuten and the andakuten with equal results, as shown in the table that just popped up. I mentioned earlier that I think I made the right decision when choosing to start my Japanese learning journey by getting fully acquainted with the two simpler Japanese writing systems, hiragana and katakana, before even attempting to study any sort of vocabulary or grammar. And why boils down to two reasons accessibility and prevention of burnout. Let's start with accessibility. Can an expiring student hope to get material if they don't know hiragana and katakana? So much material in fact that it might prompt said student to keep postponing the study of the Japanese syllabaries for months. And why it is so easy to neglect hiragana and katakana, you ask? Because of the existence of something often referred to as romaji or romanized Japanese. Homaji might be used in any context where a Japanese text is targeted as someone who cannot read kanji or kana. Passports and textbooks for foreigns are both examples of where one can find homaji. So for example, this kanji, which means cat, or the word, well, this word, which is a common greeting, will be presented to a foreigner as neko and konichiwa respectively. Note that, however, there are often multiple ways to romanize a word due to the fact that there are several different systems used on the process of romanization. The earliest Japanese romanization system was based on Portuguese orthography. Jesuit priests printed a series of Catholic books in Homaji so that the missionaries could preach without having to learn how to read Japanese orthography. From the mid 19th century onward, several systems were developed, including the most famous Hepburn, which follows the English phonology, Neon Shiki, which follows the Japanese syllabary very strictly because it was created by and for Japanese people, and Kunrei Shiki, a modified version of Neon Shiki, which is taught in Japanese elementary school. There are also many more variants that result from people simplifying the above-mentioned systems, mixing them together, establishing a style, or straight up making mistakes. The point is that Romaji is very easy available, it's very easy to fall into its claws. But if you don't consume text in kana and kanji, you are not consuming text made from Japanese to Japanese. And just to clarify, when I say you should study hiragana and katakana, I'm not just referring to simple memorization. You should be able to pick a text and convert the hiragana and katakana that you find there into sounds without having to think about it. This is the level that you should aspire to before moving on. And it's not difficult, it is something that you can achieve in just a couple weeks. And once you get that out of the way, you'll never feel insecure about these characters ever again and this will never get in your way while you are studying other topics. To add to that, the sooner you learn hiragana and katakana, the more Japanese text you are going to be able to consume without experiencing burnout. While you are insecure about the characters, reading just three lines of text will be enough to really tire you out. But if you are secure in your characters, you can endure for much longer. I'm sure you are already convinced of the importance of these scripts, so I shall proceed to put out there some ideas on how to advance from here. As for the method or methods you should choose, 
that will depend entirely on your goals. If you aren't really sure what your goal is in the first place, a mixture of methods might be your best bet. Certainly you remember the year spent in primary school filling up sheet after sheet with the letters of the alphabet. Well, with this method, this is exactly what you do. You draw each character over and over again until it becomes ingrained in your muscle memory. You can find several hiragana and katakana practice sheets available for download with a simple Google search. This method might be a bit boring, but it can be precious if your goal is to start writing in Japanese as fast as possible. On the more, it will allow you to be able to communicate in written Japanese even if your digital devices are taken from you. I personally didn't use this method, so if someone were to ask me to write down certain characters from memory, the end result will be something capable of giving nightmares to any Japanese native person. It is a question of priorities. My priorities were elsewhere and that is okay. Just remember that if you are going to use this method, you will have to take into account stroke order. There is a right way of writing every character and set order is really important for the Japanese. If you ignore this and start drawing the characters, however you feel like it, you will be at risk at creating bad habits that will be really hard to get rid of. Most students learn hiragana and katakana via exercise provided by language learning apps and videos on YouTube, such as Japanese Podcast One on One, Japanese Apple, Learn Japanese with Tanaka-san. These exercises are very varied in nature, for they have the purpose of making sure you learn how to listen, speak, read and write. I thought these last ones rarely take into account stroke order, so that is something you might want to be careful with if your goal is to properly write. These exercises are often very simple. They show a character and you have to say the sound it codes for out loud, or they emit a sound and you have to write down the corresponding character or some other practice of the same variety. They may also show entire words, and in this case, you might get to learn one or other word. Still, you should not be trying to force vocabulary into your head at this point. If you happen to see certain words so many times they happen to stick, think of it as a bonus. This method, which is my favorite, consists on buying manga in its original language and reading it. Of course, by reading, I mean translating into sounds all the hiragana and katakana you see. Sure, you will have to deal with kanji being there, but just ignore it for now. It doesn't matter either way. You don't need to worry about kanji. It also doesn't matter if you can't understand what it's being told. All you are doing is building reading pace. This method has a couple of advantages. First of all, you'll be getting some joy out of looking at the pretty pictures that go along with the text. You might even try to guess what the individuals are saying through their facial expressions alone. In the second place, you will be stocking up on study material for the future. This involves some planning ahead, but it is not complicated. All you need to know is that manga can be classified depending on its target audience. And so, there is a genre of manga called Kodomo, which is manga for children, and this manga for children can be really useful to us. I will tell you all about it later, but if you want some heads up, I'm currently using Doraemon as study material. This doesn't mean you can't use your favorite manga for this specific exercise. I, I used Berserk on my first day as a student, but realistically speaking, this kind of advanced manga will be harder to use for further progress. Lastly, depending on the mangas you pick, you might get familiar with seeing the characters in different fonts. You will see Regana melting and trembling due to the emotion experienced by a character, ugly and raspy Regana on the speech bubbles of a monster, and obviously there is the katakana. The katakana are technically an integral part of manga art, so you'll find them in the most varied shapes and forms. As for where to buy manga in Japanese, I personally use Bookwalker, that I will link below, since the site isn't stingy with technicalities such as EP. I try to buy manga in Japanese on Amazon, 
and they told me that I couldn't because I am not Japanese. I don't live in Japan. So yeah, on Bookwalker they they have none of that. You can just buy it, no matter where you are in the world. Just remember that you need to look for a manga by using its Japanese name and in Japanese characters, or you'll be unable to find it. What I do is I Google the original name, generally from Wikipedia or something, and I copy paste it into the search bar. If you can afford to buy manga right now, but you still want to try this exercise, you can use the preview pages that uh, the site makes available for you. Just pick any manga and click on the icon with a little open book on it. And there you go, you have manga to read. Memorization through cards doesn't have to be boring. Indeed, it can be a fun way to learn hiragana and katakana with friends if they also happen to be interested in Japanese or even if they only want to help you achieve your goals. On the very early stages of my learning journey, I created a card game based on Old Maid, but with study purposes. I will explain the game in detail on the next video. Whether you decide to try my game or you create your own, this method works great as a productive break and it doubles down as a bonding exercise. And there you have it, four different methods to help you on your very first steps. And as much as I would love to talk about kanji, I will have to leave that to another video because it is a very spicy subject. Until next time and good luck on your studies.